Again, um, on behalf of uh, Chief Civic Marshal, the Guam Police, the of the Guam Police Department, we want to thank you guys for taking time out of your busy schedule and joining us here today for um, the press conference involving the officer involved shooting that occurred on November 3rd, uh, 2020 and 20. Um, joining Chief Stephen Ignacio will be Major Andrew Kidigua. He is the Bureau Chief of the Criminal Investigation Division and from our legal side is Lieutenant Ron Franklin. Um, so shortly after the presentation uh, by Chief Ignacio, we'll open up for some uh, Q&A aspects. So we'll kindly ask that we limit it strictly on the officer involved shooting and if we can ask that we limit it to two questions per robin and we'll basically make our way around back to you guys for an, any additional question or any additional inquiries that you may have. So ladies and gentlemen, again, um, Chief Stephen Ignacio, the bottom of the question. Good morning, and, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I know it's a Saturday, and I'd like to thank you all for coming out here. Uh, it's a very important uh, matter that we need to discuss today, and I thank you for making the, uh, the time to come out and uh, join us today as we uh, provide this uh, press release. Okay. Okay. Uh, before proceeding with the, um, the, the, uh, the, the meat of the information, I uh, want to release today. Uh, I would like to remind the public that a life was taken in this incident. And we, as police officers, always regret the loss of life when it is by an unnatural means. But in these rare instances, when a police officer is required to discharge a high degree of use of force with the intent to stop a threat or make an arrest, the use of force sometimes requires deadly force. And unfortunately, it leads to loss of life. The Guam Police Department, in collaboration with the Guam Customs and Quarantine Agency, has completed its administrative investigation into the November 3rd, 2020, officer involved shooting that occurred in Tawuni at the Americana Lodge and has called the Islands Media today together to announce the, to the public its findings. This finding and conclusion has come after months of an exhausting administrative investigation involving the collection, review, and analysis of all available evidence, which includes police reports, forensic reports, crash reports, witness interviews, and the interviews of citizens at the scene and the surrounding neighborhood and the officers involved. We find that the actions of the four police officers in their response was justified. We will now provide you a sequence of events that transpired on the night of November 3rd, 2020. Initially, police officers responded to Bonito Street for a reported theft of a cell phone. After meeting the victim, the responding officers obtained the location of the suspect, which they also identified and confirmed um, was a stolen Mitsubishi Lancer within the parking lot of the Americana Lodge. The officers approached the suspect and the stolen vehicle, illuminated the vehicle with their flashlights and headlights from their patrol cars, and found that the vehicle's engine was on and a male and female were within the Lancer. They yelled out and instructed the male suspect who, in the dark, who was in the driver's seat to turn up the vehicle and exit, but he refused. The police officers repeatedly called to the suspect with their instructions numerous times, as confirmed by witnesses, but the suspect continuously refused and then started revving the car's engine. Moments later, the suspect accelerated towards the Lancer forward, nearly striking two police officers who jumped out of the way to avoid being run over. As the suspect continued accelerating the Lancer forward, 
the Lancer struck a patrol car that was parked at the entrance to the apartment. At that moment, one of the police officers ran to the driver's door, yelled, yelled at the driver to stop, and tried to open the door, but he was uns unsuccessful, and the suspect refused, and reversed the Lancer, forcing the officer to jump away to avoid injury and nearly striking two other officers again. After briefly stopping the suspect, ex after briefly stopping, the suspect accelerated the Lancer forward, nearly striking one of the police officers. It was at this time that this, this police officer discharged deadly force with his issued firearm at the suspect vehicle. The suspect vehicle rammed into the same patrol car and the police officer surrounded the Lancer and continued at, at the suspect to stop. One of the police officers approached the driver door and tried to break the, ve the vehicle window with his baton but failed. Despite numerous commands, the suspect continued grabbing the car engine and reversed again, nearly striking the officers. One of the police officers discharged his firearms again at the suspect vehicle. Again, the suspect vehicle stopped momentarily and again the police officers continued with their commands for the suspect to stop and surrender, but he continued to refuse. The suspect again accelerated forward and struck the police car. This time, three of the four police officers discharged their firearms at the suspect. Despite discharging their firearms, he continued to refuse to stop the car or surrender. He tried to reverse the Lancer, but the Lancer was stuck to the patrol car. The suspect then accelerated forward and another officer discharged his firearm at the suspect. The suspect then ran in, rammed into another parked car, which was the parked car of the victim of the initial uh, call regarding the stolen cell phone. Finally, after the suspect stopped revving the lantern and it stopped, the four police officers moved in and found that the suspect and the female in the car sustained injuries. They immediately called for medical help, which arrived on scene and transported both the man and the woman to GMH. When the suspect repeatedly refused to stop or surrender and recklessly drove the lancer in a small confined area of the lodge, the police officers were faced with a suspect who was armed with a 3,000 plus weapon, which was the vehicle, when he nearly struck the police officers during their attempt to arrest him. They discharged deadly force in response to the deadly force used against them and ceased the deadly force when the threat against them had stopped. So uh, now I'd like to uh, go ahead and open it to questions, and uh, I guess we can start from uh, left to right, from my left to right. We we'll start from KUAM. Um, please proceed with your questions for the chief. Um, can you tell us what GPD's firearms policy is? And at one point, does a police officer open fire on an individual? And when does he know when to stop? So, uh, you know, that would be our use of force policy. Yeah, that's our use of force policy. And so, uh, you know, the, the officers are trained uh, on when to properly discharge and, and use uh, force. Okay. Um, in this situation, why would four officers open fire and one officer shoot around 31 times out of 45 shots fired? That breaks down to about 13 shots among those other three officers. Now, in your opinion, is this excessive or is this normal to shoot at a suspect 45 times? It, so the officers will shoot and continue to, to shoot and engage, you know, until such time that the threat is neutralized or the suspect uh, is stopped. And so, as you can see, uh, you know, this matter was brought before a grand jury and uh, the grand jury found that, that uh, and they were, you know, I'm sure they were aware of the number of shots, but they found that the use of force by the officer, the use of deadly force by the officer 
was was justified. Thank you for your Chuck? Thank you, Chief. If, uh, if no part of this investigation was reconstructed by or corroborated uh, with body cam footage, is this the body cam footage something that you're looking at instituting as a policy throughout the department? Yes, you know, uh, the, the Guam Police Department has uh, discussed the use of body cam footage. Uh, you know, uh, we do have a policy in place uh, because, you know, in, in the past there were officers who uh, purchased their own body cam. And so, you know, uh, we, we want to make sure that we have body cam footage policy in place. Uh, but the Guam Police Department itself does not have any body cam footage. It's something that we, you know, we've discussed and, and we are, are continuing to explore. Uh, and my, the only other question I have is sort of just a request for you to uh, speak to our audience uh, who might question or might have uh, some waning confidence or faith in their police department. Do you have any message for them? Yes, sure. Uh, you know, the, the Guam Police Department are, are, are filled with fine men and women. And, uh, you know, we come to work every day to, to, to serve uh, our community and to keep it safe. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, I, I ask that they continue to have faith and trust in, in our men and women because uh, they're, they're a bunch of good police officers who come in every day. Thank, Thank you, sir. This is a big use, Ms. Kirin Hernandez. Yes, I'm I understand that the vehicle, you know, they, they discharged because they did use the vehicle as a criminal weapon, but was it really necessary to fire that many shots at them, even if they didn't have an open weapon on them? Uh, again, like I said, you know, uh, use of force is allowed, and, and then the continued use of force is allowed until such time a threat is neutralized. In other words, the threat has stopped. So, so the use of force is in direct correlation uh, to the force that's being presented uh, against them, the deadly force being presented against them. Uh, just not my question, but a point of clarification. You mentioned a cell phone theft, and then the suspect was found in a stolen Mitsubishi. Or is that you, Mr. Kaitaka? Was the was the suspect of a cell phone theft, or are those two separate? Incidents? Yeah. So, so what happened is uh, the, we were called there initially because the the owner of a cell phone. Had, was able to, to trace the cell phone to the location okay. and uh, he was able to identify that it was there with, within that area and uh, we came across Mr. Tetaka inside a stolen vehicle and I believe we recovered the phone and we recovered the stolen cell phone within the vehicle where within Mr. Tetaka was at. Okay, that's not my question. My first right. question is, who is the officer? Are you able to name him and how long had so all of all of the officers have initially were placed on administrative leave, and we exhausted the administrative leave process, and uh, all have been returned uh, to duty, and uh, unfortunately we do not uh, identify the names of the officers because they're involved in an administrative investigation. Uh, how long had the officer that was presented to the grand jury been um, with the police force? I, I, don't, I don't have that information. Okay, that. that was part of my first question. And then my second question, so you're all seasoned officers at this table. We know of um, the Seabury shooting that was charged. We know of the officer, the police officer, the late um, Mr. I think it was Castro. He was charged with the case was dropped. Can you guys recall a time when an officer has been charged, uh, convicted of a shooting when they're on duty in all of your years of service? I, I, I can't think of one, uh, but you know, uh, again, you, you're using, I think you're talking about the Mr. Castro case. Yeah, that was an airport officer. The airport. He was and so you gotta remember that. Probation officer. No, no, he's an airport police. Uh, yeah, airport. Airport. You know, the, the airport police has their own uh, standards right. for use of force, so I cannot compare the, the Guam Police Department with another agency, you know, um, we're, we're all different, uh, we're all the same but different uh, in the sense that, you know, they adopt their own use of force policies and not familiar, right? But, uh, so you can't recall a time in your tenure, decades of tenure, when a, a uniformed officer shot someone fatally on duty and was uh, convicted? I, I can't think anybody no. up there, up here on this table has, has any experience with that. And, you know, we've only, I've only been here for the past 30 years, but I can't think of any. Thank you. Um, Mr. Nick Delgado from the Post. Hi, Chief. Good morning, guys. Uh, so, thanks for explaining the sequence of events, Chief. Do you have a timeline from the uh, from the moment that police first approached the vehicle with the two inside 
to right before they call and they found the two shot inside the vehicle. What was that time frame? Because I'm wondering, just like my colleagues here have those same questions with the amount of shots that were fired, I'm wondering how long did all of that unfold? Um, minutes to seconds. Yeah, yeah. N not long. Not minute. even a minute. Minutes to seconds. You have to understand that it's rapidly developing and it was dynamic. The officers arrive on scene. They start obtaining information from the victim who was in the vehicle that was rammed at the end. They confirm with dispatch the vehicle was stolen. Mm -hmm. The same vehicle for which the suspect or the victim had traced the cell phone to. And as they approached the vehicle, everything from them was seconds. So I think what Nick, what you're getting at is that uh, definitely it's not like the officers approached and then two minutes later they, 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 they decided to shoot right. and then they stopped and then three minutes later, you know, they're start shooting again. This was not this is not something that laid out in a ten minute or fifteen minute time frame. You know, this is a rapidly developing situation, and it, it, you know it escalates. You know, from the physical presence of the officers, and that's the use of force, right? right? The physical presence of the officer is the first part of the use of force continuum. Then they get, then they also the commands to stop. You know, to get out. You know, and so it continued to escalate upward, and as much as it escalates upward, the officers also are trying to de-escalate and bring it back down. But when at the point when the, the suspect refuses and continues to use this car as a weapon against the officers and people in the surrounding area, the victim of the cell phone who was in, in the immediate vicinity, things tend to escalate up and then we meet that escalation with uh, the force necessary. And at this point, because we're using a vehicle as a weapon, the force escalates up into the use of deadly force. And I know you said, Ron, minutes to seconds, I'm not sure what that means, but no estimate then? I mean, no, once of no, investigation, no, no, five minutes, one minute, zero minutes? I understand that nobody's keeping time as they're approaching the of suspect. Of course, of course, but you got the sequence of events there from beginning to end, you can get an estimate based on four months of it's investigating. Seconds. It's seconds. Seconds, that's what, that's yeah. what I'm wondering. I, I, it sounds like all this happened in, a, in less than a minute, but then that gives that one officer yeah. how many opportunities to change yeah, so out? So I think, Nick, what we can do is, I would definitely go back and we can look at the call log and look at the time that the officers first call in the, the approach yeah. uh, to the time they call for a medic and then and they'll probably give us a time frame and we definitely can get back to them there. And again, and, and just, just understand guys, the reason I asked is because if one officer was being uh, prosecuted against, potentially prosecuted against for shooting 31 rounds, how how long do you have to, to change out your weapon each time or do you have multiple or? Yeah, so, so we'll get back to you in that, Nick, definitely. We'll, we'll look at the time frame. Chief, you mentioned to me a couple, two to three weeks ago that the internal affairs investigation was completed and right. needed to speak with Attorney General Levin Camacho yeah. to find out how to move forward from there. But since there was no true bill yesterday, is the justification you say today, did, was it motivated by that no true bill? Or no. was this always the case? This was always ago? the case. Uh, since, since uh, you know, because we have to work within a time frame, right? We have that 90 day time frame. And so our findings were within that time frame. But, you know, understanding that there was a parallel criminal investigation ongoing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we didn't want to do a premier, uh, release of information because we did not want to affect any of the outcome mm -hmm. of a criminal investigation. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. you, want to, you want to make sure that we protect the integrity of both our internal affairs investigation and the integrity of the criminal investigation. You know, and that's why, you know, uh, I coordinated, uh, you know, all of our efforts along with uh, the Attorney General Wong. And make sure that you know as we move forward, you know uh, there, there's um, information that's provided to the public uh, as timely as we can. And understanding that you know, of course, criminal investigations always take longer than internal affairs investigation because their their timelines are, are bound by the statute limitation, which is a lot longer than a, an administrative investigation. So it's kind of obvious then for your investigators that there wasn't going to be an indictment because you found justification already in the administrative process. No. Nope. Uh, again, uh, as you can see, that the Attorney General of Guam, uh, without you know, our, our findings are our findings, but he they moved forward on, on their side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so nothing that they do affects what we do. Nothing that I do affects what. Uh, nothing that they do affects what I do. As you can see, yeah. we clear our, our officers uh, back during that 90-day time frame, mm -hmm. but the Attorney General uh, felt that they had enough information. To at least move forward to present a case to the grand jury, but of course the grand jury uh, returned in no true bill. Here we go. Okay. The, the, the second Robin. Uh, we'll go back to Caleb. You have one question. 
Okay, thank you. Do you have anything to say to the Tadaltal family? Yes, you know, uh, this is a tragic event. Uh, somebody's life was lost. And I can tell you that there is no police officer that comes into work with any intent to use deadly force. Matter of fact, that is probably something that we never want to do. And it's not even the, the last thing that we think of. It's something that we, we, we hope and pray that we, when we come in, that we never have to pull out our gun and use deadly force against a fellow human being. But unfortunately, this is law enforcement work. This is police work. This is what we train to do. Uh, and, and, and we're trained to use a deadly force when justified and when uh, needed to do so. We extend our condolences to the Tataldo family. And you know, this is a, a very tragic event, but uh, you know, th th this is part of police work. And uh, you know, the, the, the burden also is on the officers because they must live with this work the rest of their life. Uh, as much as uh, the Tataldo family lost a son, a brother and an uncle, uh, and they have to, to deal with that burden. Uh, the officers too have a burden to carry uh, for the, for the rest of their careers, and, and this is something that we don't wish upon anybody, and uh, this is something that we don't look forward to doing at any time. You know, uh, taking the life of a, of a fellow human being is not something to be taken lightly, and that's why only certain people in our community are trusted with that uh, ability. <coughs> Uh, you know, to, to do, and that's your police officers. And sorry, what about the female victim? Um, anything to say to her, her family, or w what's her status? I, I, you know, uh, I, yeah, it's my understanding that the female uh, passed away, but I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, privy to any information as to whether or not uh, her passing had anything to do with uh, this shooting. I, I think that's something that uh, was part of the criminal investigation. Uh, yeah, there was uh, a few years ago, there was a suicide by cop over at the Veterans Cemetery. Remember that, where a guy was waving around a gun yes, and yes, pointing it toward PD Middle School. Um, it, what was the, was the, the number of bullets that were uh, shots fired by the police officers comparable to this scenario? Uh, I, I don't believe so, but again, you know, uh, Troy, you know, each case is unique and different in its own in its own way, uh, and the, the amount of use of force again is uh, dependent upon uh, you know the, the circumstances. So it, it's not uh, it's, you know it's not a really an apples to apples comparison because each case is unique. Each case has a different set of circumstances. Do you think we could um, uh, get more specific information about uh, the case in TD uh, about the number of shots fired later from Sergeant Paul Tapal. Yeah, or from uh, your sorry. office. Yeah, we're trying to get up. And, that's, and, that's many years ago. Yes, that's, yes, not yes. a year, not a little bit years ago, but many, many years ago. Oh, yeah, I guess I'm old. <laughs> uh, and if any of the officers in here have been, been in a situation uh, uh, where someone is shooting at you or using a uh, deadly weapon against you or threatening to do so, can you explain to our audience how quickly the situation goes and what the office, the sort of uh, a decision-making process that goes into sure. uh, how to defend yourself? You know, I'll speak to my personal experience. Uh, I was with uh, a partner, and uh, we were involved in a, an attempt to uh, pull over a vehicle uh, that was involved in a domestic uh, dispute. And uh, I was driving the vehicle, and uh, my partner was a passenger. And we, were, we pulled into the parking lot of uh, St. John's School in Upper Tuman, and the suspect, the, 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 the husband, or the ex-husband of this female, uh, they both drove into the St. John's parking lot. The suspect jumped out and was attempting to stab his wife through a closed window. Within the, the seconds that it took for me to try and drive up behind the car, put it in park, my partner had already come out and started to engage and shoot at the suspect which caused him to stop. So these things unfold very, very rapidly. I mean, I couldn't even get the car into park yet. And my partner was already out recognizing that there was a threat against the female victim by a suspect who was trying to stab her with, with a knife through a closed window. And so, no, nope, I couldn't even get into park before this, this officer had, you know, 
recognized that a threat was uh, imminent and immediate, and uh, he was already engaging a suspect before I could get out of the vehicle. How, how did he engage her? How did he, no, I mean, how did he engage the suspect, sorry? He, he, he opened the door and got out and uh, recognized that, that he was uh, trying to stab his, his wife, and so he, uh, he immediately discharged his firearm towards the suspect. Lethally? Uh, no, no. Uh, yes, hi. So, so what is the current status of the police officers that were involved in this case? Like I said, uh, all the police officers uh, have been cleared and, and are back to, to duty, to full duty. Full duty. And also, like, like as uh, Kayla mentioned, that you haven't heard anything from the, the female that was with the suspect and anything from them, any comments or anything. What can you say to them if, if they were able to? Yeah, again, you know, like I said, this is a very tragic and unfortunate incident. I know uh, we, we extend our condolences uh, to the families. Uh, this is not something that police officers look forward to doing. Uh, this is a, the, the toughest part of uh, the, the job of a police officer. Yes. Okay. So, again, also, can you explain, like, you know, especially to the public, whether, you know, to get a full, I guess, cleanest terms to grasp of what happens when a scene like that does happen and an officer has to think on their feet and the process of disarming their weapons and so on. I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. When they have to um, make that decision right away to pull up their firearms and... Chief, can I, can I answer? Sure. All officers are uh, receive comprehensive training on the use of force options that they have, right? So the chief did talk a little bit about the use of force, the use of force continuum, using verbal commands at the very beginning, uh, and it, it escalates. Uh, depending on the force that you are facing. So they are trained to use their firearm in, in defense of themselves to stop deadly force. And that is the only limitation they are allowed to use deadly force. So as soon as the deadly force is stopped, then they, then they recover. Okay, so there's a lot of training that is involved with the use of all force options. That includes tasers, chemical sprays, all handcuffs, batons, and unfortunately, we have to use our firearms at some time. So, the, the, and, and to answer your question as well, sir, you know, the, the use of the firearm is, is, is a lot, it goes a lot, in, a lot of training goes into it. So, it is seconds to reload, right? But that's through a lot of training. And none of us, um, very few of us, experience uh, having to use that deadly force. But they are trained, and, and um, it's something that we, we train them for defense. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, PNC. Yes. Uh, the, the female passenger, so now that we know that she's passed away, will there be an investigation into her passing? Will there be uh, again, an IA investigation, that, a criminal investigation, or was that sort of woven? That, that, that was woven into the, the criminal investigation. Uh, because when, when we were notified of her death, uh, I also made contact with the AG's office and he was already aware. And it was something that they, they wove into uh, their, their case. Did they um, get an autopsy from one of the Hawaii doctors I don't, for her? I, I don't know, ma'am. Okay. What was the female victim's name? I am sorry, I don't have that name with me. Vicky Rages. I believe so, yeah, but I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, right. the last one. Uh, Chief, a reader actually uh, asked, why didn't they just shoot at the tires to stop the car? Uh, in, the, in the use of force training and the use of force continuum, we don't shoot at tires. Okay. No matter the situation. We don't, shoot, we don't shoot at tires. We're not trained to shoot at tires. And Police officers do not take their gun out of their holsters to shoot at tires. You mentioned a lot of training goes into when using or when, when changing up the weapon and using it as well. I'm wondering, was there any additional training that you uh, uh, put on your officers or even counseling for those officers that were involved in this shooting? Yes, absolutely. So uh, that, that's a good question, Nick. So we do have a peer support group, and uh, we, we actually use them uh, to work with the trauma of what the officers uh, were involved in the shooting. Uh, we used it for this instance, and we also used it for the officers that responded yeah, to that beheading uh, down in right? San Rita, because you know that's a very you know, traumatic event where the officers, you know, I mean, have to walk into. I've never dealt with a decapitated uh, homicide victim, yeah. and so you know that that's a very traumatic event for the officers, and you know, of course, the family as well. 
But at our level, with the Guam Police Department, we have a peer support group, and we work closely with the Guam Behavioral Health, and uh, they brought up their mental health counselors to work with our peer support group uh, to work through the trauma of the officers that were involved in this. Uh, before we go, uh, I'd like to close with, um, I'd like to thank uh, Director Ike Pareto uh, for um, his two internal affairs investigators who were sent over to assist uh, our internal affairs section with this, this investigation. And uh, I'd like to thank them uh, for, for their, uh, their, their work that they put in in uh, helping us wrap up uh, this investigation. And uh, if I may, Chief, real brief a message from the mother of Xavier to tell, tell Carol Anderson. She writes this morning, they murdered my son. They can say all they can. They can uh, say all they ever lie about to cover up the injustice. Vicki Ann is no longer here also, so they can continue to lie. She was a witness to it, and I pray her statements unveiled. She thanks the media for keeping her informed, and she ends it by saying, God knows, with prayer emotions. I mean, you know, and, and again, you know, my, my, my condolences to uh, Miss Carol and, uh, you know, the, the, the tragic loss of her son. But uh, these are the circumstances that, that un unfolded, and, uh, you know, we cannot turn back time. We, we cannot undo what has been done. And, uh, you know, uh, this case was investigated by internal affairs investigators from Customs and Quarantine. Uh, we asked and we worked alongside the AG's office and turned the criminal investigation over to them, you know, so that uh, there, we remove any uh, notion that there's going to be uh, impropriety on our part, uh, you know, to, to even uh, use the word that word cover up, you know, that, uh, you know, we were try trying to make sure that we removed ourselves from the criminal investigation uh, so that, you know, there's an unbiased and objective investigation being done by an outside entity other than within our, our Guam Police Department. And, um, you know, uh, I, I think we, we, we've done what we've uh, needed to do. And, you know, th these are unfortunate circumstances that have unfolded before us. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh. We just wrapped up the press conference with GPD on the December 2020 fatal shooting of Xavier Tatal, which involved four police officers, one of them in particular, firing 31 out of the 45 shots fired. Now, we also did learn that um, not only did this lead to the death of of Xavier to Tautau, but also the female victim passenger that was with him, uh, Vicky Regis. So as GPD was explaining, um, the entire incident happened within a matter of seconds. Officers repeatedly tried to uh, get Xavier to Tautau to come out of the vehicle, stop the vehicle, um, but he repeatedly revved his engine, um, did re he refused to come out of the vehicle, and uh, attempted numerous times to um, hit officers with his car, uh, also hitting the patrol car about twice, I believe that's what he said. Um, throughout the entire situation, GPD officers telling him to stop again, him refusing. And uh, again, this is something that the Guam Police Department did say that um, it is a very tragic situation and they never look forward to using uh, any kind of deadly force on anyone and um, gives their regards to the family. So reporting from GPD headquarters in Tietzen, I'm Tyler Matinari.